I don't know about you, but uh, for the last six weeks or so, my social media has been blowing up with pop-up ads. And most of those ads have been centered on one theme, how to live a healthier life. Now maybe they figured out, which they always do, that I'm 55 years old and I need those. But I think all of us are getting those at this time of year, special diets, new exercise apps, especially gadgets. Things you can wear around your wrist to tell you how many steps you take, how many calories you use. How many have one on right now? I've got one. How many have a Fitbit on? Right? I mean, they revolutionize your, your health. Amen? Amen. Right? But today, I've got something special to share with you because I know we're interested in healthy living, but we're also hit, interested in a healthy spiritual life. And so I saw this ad, and it's, it was on the Babylon Bee, so it has to be true. And it was advertising a spiritual Fitbit. And so can I just read some of this? According to Lifeway press release, again, it has to be true. The Christian retail giant, they have teamed up with Fitbit in order to release a new spiritual health tracker. A wrist-worn device that keeps track of all your spiritual activity. From raising hands in church and turning pages in your Bible to folding your hands to pray, serving soup at homeless shelters, this spiritual Fitbit will let you know when you're earning precious spiritual points and when you're backsliding like a heathen. Quoting the head of research and development, Martin Fryer of Lifeway, our patented technology will let you set attainable spiritual goals for yourself and then see how you measure up. In fact, you can chart your spiritual activity and even compete with your friends to see which one of you is the godliest. Now, I, I don't want to get you too excited, but there is some talk in the Bible department of making this required for next year's Bible and the Gospel class. But there's a complete list of spiritual activities they can track. Number of Bible pages turned, how many hands you shake at church on Sunday, how long you reflect on your sins before you take communion. Uh, an important one, your heart rate during, chirp, during sermons. How long you hold your hands are folded. How vigorously you wave your hands around like a palm tree in a hurricane during the worship set. Number of tracks passed out. Number of words typed arguing with atheists on the internet. <laughs> now, I got to warn you. It can do all that positive stuff, but LifeWay also claims that this advanced new Fitbit technology, it can deduct points for reading an inappropriate novel like Fifty Shades of Grey or for changing the television to an HBO Game of Thrones marathon. <laughs> Quoting Friar, does the good outweigh the bad in your everyday life? Find out with the spiritual Fitbit from LifeWay. Now, the thing about sarcasm and humor is that it's funny because there's always a ring of truth behind it. And in actuality, we all want to be spiritually healthy. And there's always that temptation to look for shortcuts and magic bullets. And more than that, there's a sneaky temptation to use outward activity and achievement as means of measuring our spiritual health. <laughs> That's nothing new, though. The Apostle Paul was concerned about this legalistic tendency way back in his day. And you know that not only by the communication, the themes of his books, but actually how he structured his letters. Almost every letter that Paul writes, you can divide into two halves. Colossians 1 and 2, Colossians 3 and 4. Ephesians 1 through 3, Ephesians 4 to 6. And in the second half of Paul's books, he deals with behavior. He deals with practical Christian living in the home and at work and at church, the sexual ethics that we have, lots of how-tos, how to live the Christian life. But that's never where he begins. You see, Paul takes the first half of his books before behavior, and he talks about identity. He talks about who we are and who we are in Jesus. You see, before the question of how, Paul asked the question, who? And today, 
we're going to look at one of those prime passages in the book of Ephesians where Paul lays out exactly who we are in Jesus Christ. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul will summon all of his rhetorical skills and use every ounce of eloquence at his disposal to shine the light on Christ and on who we are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word and in honor of the Jesus to whom it proclaims? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. It's in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things, all things in him, things in heaven and things in earth. It's in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Paul gives us at least a dozen reminders of who we are in this passage. But today, for our time together, I just want to pick three. I want to pick three reminders about who we are in Jesus. Two of the three jump off the text, and the other one, well, it's just one of those lessons God has been teaching me for the last dozen or so years. So this morning, let's look at three reminders about who we are in Christ. Number one, reminder number one, we are chosen. We are chosen. Now, I'm not talking about fifth grade recess kind of choosing. You're playing a big game of kickball, Two captains, everybody against the wall. Your whole prayer is, Lord, don't let me be last, right? It's about who you know, and they pick you based on your abilities, and it's all politics, right? It's not that kind of choosing. Paul, when he talks about choosing and God's choosing of us, it's something very different. God's choosing, according to Paul, has nothing to do with us. God's choosing has everything to do with him. The grammar of the passage suggests it. The theology of the passage demands it, and a well-placed metaphor illustrates it. God's choosing has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him. First, the grammar of the passage suggests it. Open back up to your passage. We're going to go back to Spiffo 101 for your upperclassmen and the Bible and the gospel for the freshmen. And I, I, you know, hopefully you learned that you could never study your Bible without a pen in hand. Hopefully, if you're spiritual enough, it's a colored pen, and you can mark the grammatical clues of your Bible. And the first thing you need to do is go there and circle the verbs and the verby looking words. As the English teacher says, that's where the action is. Verbs, action, okay, sorry. All right, so first, circle the verbs and verby looking words. Let's just skim through it. Blessed be the Lord God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed, circle, us in Christ. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose, circle us in him. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be, circle, holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined, circle, 
us an adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Down to verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace in which he has circle blessed us and the beloved. In him we have circle redemption. Down to verse 8. Which he circle lavished upon us. Down to verse 9. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he has circle set forth in Christ. And then verse 10. To unite circle all things. We'll just stop there. So first you have the verbs. You got the verby words. We know the action. Now the second thing you got to do is go back to those verbs and look for the subject who's doing the action and then look for the object who's receiving the action. Now if some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, then you need to go back to your high school English teacher and sue her for malpractice. If you don't know your grammar, you can't study your Bible. Amen, Bible profs? You got to know your grammar. That was real. They they skipped today, so that's okay. Um, No, that's a lie. Bible profs never skip chapel. Uh, Okay, so go back. Blessed. Underline the subject. Who has blessed? And that who refers back to God. It's God who blessed. And who did he bless? Us. Now draw an arrow connecting the two. Go down to chose in verse 4. Who's the subject? He. It's God. Who's the object? Us. Draw an arrow connecting the two. Go down to verse 5. Predestined. Who predestined? God. He. Who did he predestine? Us. Draw an arrow. Go down to verse 6. Blessed. Who blessed? He. God. Who did he bless? Us. Draw an arrow. Are you starting to see a pattern? Who does the action? Who receives the action? The grammar suggests God's choosing has everything to do with him. It has nothing to do with us. But it's not just the grammar. It's also the theology of the passage that demands it. There's some deep theology in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm not talking Theo 1. I'm talking Theo 2 stuff. And I, I hate to tell you, it may be some upper level Bible major stuff. I mean, just look at the phrases. Verse 3, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. What in the world does that mean? Verse 5, he predestined us. Verse 5, according to the purpose of his will. Verse 10, a plan for the fullness of time. Verse 11, having be predestined. There's that word again. The counsel of his will, verse 11, sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, it's this type of passage where Luther and Calvin And Jonathan Edwards made their theological bones. That's where their theology was born, in this kind of passage. Billy Marsh and Jeremy Kimball, their mouths are salivating right now. This is deep stuff. It's good stuff. And what it tells us, God's choosing has everything to do with us and nothing to do with us. So how's some lowly chapel speaker supposed to address this in 30 minutes? Easy. You just go to Paul's well-placed illustration. He uses a metaphor to tell us what this means. And it's found in the middle of verse 5. He predestined us for adoption. As sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. I never understood what this metaphor meant until about 22 years ago. I was standing with my wife on the third floor of a hotel in Nanchang, China. In a hallway with nine other American families. We were standing across from two elevator doors, waiting expectantly. And sure enough, it went ding, the doors opened, and off those doors walked ten Chinese ladies. In each of their arms, they had a baby Chinese girl. The ladies and the babies were on one side of the hall. The American couples on the other side in the middle was the orphanage director and a translator. The orphanage director would read a name, Fu Xiao. The translator would read a name, Scott and Sarah Dixon. And that lady took Fu Xiao and put her in the arms of my wife. And Fu Xiao became Ellen Patricia Xiao Dixon. Now I have a question for you. Ellie, who is now 22, uh, engaged to the lovely Sam. Uh, She is now 22. And how much did Ellie have to do with the fact that she's adopted into the Dixon family? For whatever reason, in the pressures of the Chinese government in the mid-90s and the one-child policy, her birth parents couldn't keep her. For whatever reason, my wife, after graduating from college, chose to spend a year in Beijing teaching English. And while she was there, two of her best friends had to get forced adoptions because of that one-child policy. What did Ellie have to do with that? 
What did Ellie have to do with the fact that 10 years later, my wife was leafing through a Christian magazine and saw an ad from Holt International offering American couples the chance to adopt these abandoned Chinese baby girls? What did Ellie have to do with the fact that some bureaucrat in China, in Beijing, circled her name, Fu Xiao, circled the name of the Dixons and drew a line in between? What did Ellie have to do with that? Answer, absolutely nothing. But yet, in a number of years, when her mom and dad are no longer here, she will be given the opportunity to have 20% of the hundreds of dollars left over. <laughs> she will be a Dixon. God's choosing. It's adoption. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him. Remembering that we are chosen will free us from having to prove our worth. Our whole world is desperate to prove its worth. To answer two questions, do I matter and am I loved? And ever since Genesis 3, we've been looking for someplace else other than God and we can't find it and we're desperate. Even our fictional characters are desperate for it. Rocky Balboa in the first movie, Rocky, was skating. Well, actually, he wasn't skating. He was walking while his girlfriend, Adrian, was skating. And she said, Rocky, why aren't you skating? Rocky said, I ain't skated since I was 15. That's when I started fighting. And I got to watch the ankles. Yeah, fighting used to be tops of me, but no more. All I wanted to prove was I weren't no bum. That I had the stuff to make a good pro. Everybody in our world is trying to prove they weren't no bum to prove they matter, to earn. And unfortunately, we as Christians can find ourselves sometimes doing the same thing with God's love, thinking we have to earn it, thinking we have to keep it, thinking we have to do something to achieve it. My oldest daughter, Claire, when she was three, used to love to cuddle and rock and sing songs before bed. And when you're three, the only songs you know are Sunday school songs. So we used to sing Jesus Loves Me. And one evening while we were doing that, it kind of hit me. I don't think a lot of Christians believe this song. What do you mean, Scott? Come on. Jesus loves me. Jesus, we believe in Jesus. That's why we're at a Christian college. Loves us. First verse of Awana, John 3, 16. God so loves me. That's the one that's tough. Does he really love me? Doesn't he know what's down there? Doesn't he know what I've done, what I've thought, what I've said? Does he really love me? You gotta finish the song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And my Bible tells me Jesus loves me just because he wants to. It has everything to do with him. It has nothing to do with me. That's lesson number one. Remember you are chosen. Remember, you don't have to prove your worth anymore. Reminder number two, we are redeemed and forgiven. We are redeemed and forgiven. Down in verse seven, in him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he, I love this verb, lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Another observation. Why do we begin our walk with Jesus admitting our brokenness, but then as the journey continues, struggling, struggling to admit it? I've taught theology at Cedarville for 20 years, and I always try to take a poll of when my students were converted, and literally it's about 8.7 years of age. Makes sense, right? Most of you came from Christian homes, you got saved early. But think about it. When you're saved at 8.7, how much do you really know of your sin and your sin nature? Yeah, you bop your little sister on the head every once in a while. You still haven't confessed to stealing the cookie that one evening. You blamed your brother. There's stuff, you know, I mean, we're sinners. We know that. We consciously know that. But let me tell you something. You don't know the half of it at eight years old. 
I'm convinced that part of sanctification is God teaching us how deep our depravity goes. The more mature you come in the Christian life, the more you know you're a sinner. And so what can happen, we start a good place. Jesus, you took my sins at eight. You're, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm trusting that. But it's kind of a thin understanding of our sin. And when we get to 20, when we get to 40, and we get to 50, and if our understanding of our sin is still thin, we're not going to be able to understand the grace of God and his forgiveness that he lavished on us. What can happen is you start assuming that you have to clean yourself up before you approach God. Like if he really found out who you are today, <laughs> he'd pack his bags and leave. When we first meet Jesus in our sin, we don't know the half of it. And it takes years to learn the depths of that depravity. But when we see it, we just want to cover it up. We don't want to look at it and we, do, we don't want God to see it. If he knew what I was looking at in the computer last night, if Jesus knew how I treated my unit mates last week, oh, if those little shortcuts I take on my homework, they're not quite cheating. If he knew that, if he knew how I talked to my mom on the phone yesterday, oh, Cedarville, Jesus already knows. And guess what? He still loves you. He still forgives you. He still died for you. Satan's lie. Scott, if God only knew, if Jesus only knew that part of you, you, Paul says, God already knows. Jesus already knows and he still died for you. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love toward us that when we clean ourselves up, no. <laughs> Romans 5, 8 says that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are redeemed and we are forgiven. One of my favorite old authors is John Newton. John Newton wrote a number of songs, first being Amazing Grace, but he also wrote thousands of letters. John Newton spent the first years of his adult life unsaved as a slave ship captain. If you can think of any more depraved occupation it's slave ship captain, making your money, selling people, selling flesh. But then God miraculously saved him. And for 40 years, he was an Anglican minister in London. But what's interesting about John Newton is that when he wrote those letters, he would often sign off as the old African blasphemer or the old slave trader. He just kept bringing it up and bringing it up. It's like, why do you do that, John? You've been saved. Why do you keep bringing up your sin? It's because John Newton knew this. He knew what Paul was trying to say. If you don't know the depths of his sin, you won't understand the depths of God's grace. In fact, one letter he wrote said, the purpose of God in showing believers the evil of their own hearts is to make them prize more highly the grace and all sufficiency of Jesus. Don't hide your sin. Hold it up, name it, confess it. Allow yourself to understand that God forgives it and he loves you. One of my favorite quotes from John Newton, the old blasphemer. I am more ashamed now than when I began to seek him. I am more ashamed now and I expect to be most of all ashamed when he shall appear to destroy my last enemy. But oh, I may rejoice in him to think that he will not be ashamed of me. You're redeemed. You're forgiven. And when you know that, it frees us to admit our brokenness. We're chosen, we're free. Number three, reminder, we are trophies of God's grace. Trophies of God's grace. Back to Spiffo 101. Underlining repeated phrases. Underlining repeated phrases. Those also will help us make sense of what the author is trying to make. I just want to show you three. Verse six, underline this. To the praise of his glorious grace. Now skip down to verse 12. So that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be underlined to the praise of his glory. And then down at the end of verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Underlined to the praise of his glory. What is Paul trying to say? 
that we are trophies of God's grace. It's his glory, it's not ours. That will help us not have to feel like we have to collect trophies. You know, we spend our entire lives collecting trophies. In fact, I brought one, maybe my most important one from high school. You don't do these anymore, I don't think, but we did back in the 80s, 70s. This is my varsity jacket. I, since the fifth grade, I planned to earn this. And the only reason I wanted to earn this was so I could walk down the mall in Springfield. By the way, a mall is a place where they have shops where you actually go buy stuff and take it home. But anyway, the, the, and, and I would walk down that mall and people could point at me in my jacket and say, there goes a varsity athlete. Oh, I, this was my trophy. I dreamed. But I got I to tell you something. When I moved to Cedarville you, College back then, six blocks from Scott Street. Yes, I grew up on Scott Street in Cedarville. I moved six blocks to the hill to car four. Yeah, yeah car. This thing stayed in my bedroom closet because when you leave high school, you got to start getting all new trophies. And some of you are doing a bang up job collecting trophies in college. But let me tell you something come May, when you're a senior and you walk across the stage and shake Dr. White's hand, you got to start a whole new batch of trophies. Nobody's going to care about your GPA and your triple major. It may get you an interview, but after that, they don't care. And you've got to start making all sorts of new trophies. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a cubicle, moving to an office, moving to a window office. Maybe you're going to get married. Then you've got to start getting a house with a mortgage and a car with a payment. Adult trophies are a lot more expensive. <laughs> and then you're going to get kids. Oh, when kids come, then it gets really bad. What's... <laughs> Did I say that right? I don't know. <laughs> But you know what happens? You start collecting trophies by osmosis through your kids. You do. You wonder why your parents put so much pressure on you for grades and sports? They want trophies. It's all about trophies. We gotta have them. We're always looking, always needing trophies. And it gets exhausting, doesn't it? Tires you out. Get me off that conveyor belt. And that's what Paul's trying to do. He says, we don't have to spend our life collecting trophies. We don't have to spend our lives earning the praise of men. We're to spend our lives displaying the grace of God. Remembering where your trophies frees us from the pressure of collecting trophies. I want you to imagine you're back in high school right now. You're back at camp, summer camp, the best week of the year. And it's Friday night. Campfire's going Friday night. All the cabins are laid sitting around the room, sitting around the campfire. You got the hunky looking worship leader, college guy, playing a guitar in the back. You've been giving testimonies, sharing what Jesus has been doing this week. All the girl cabins are crying. All the guy cabins, well, they're doing what guy cabins do. But now it's time for the camp speaker to come back up. One more time of dedication before you go home tomorrow. Pastor Scott steps up. Young people, we've been talking about the book of Ephesians this year, this week, and year. God chose us. God redeems and forgives us. And number three, he has made us a trophy. But some of you, you still have trophies in your life. You still have trophies you need to get rid of. So right now, the counselors are passing out three by five cards and pencils. And I want you to go ahead and write down that trophy that you're trying to earn. Girls, write down that boyfriend's name. <laughs> Guys, write down that truck's make and model. You drive to school every day. What is that trophy? What sport? What GPA? What school, college you're trying to get into? Write that down. And as John leads us, we're going to have you come forward and take that three by five card. You're going to throw it in the fire. You don't need no stinking trophies. Amen. Stop. Thank you. <laughs> what have I just done? I have just committed camp speaker malpractice. <laughs> I have. I've just totally obliterated the message of Paul. I flipped the script. I focused on behavior, not identity. 
You know what I've done? I've made you exchange one trophy for another. Now you don't look for trophies in relationships and achievements. Now you just look for trophies in the fact that you don't have trophies. I've given you a moral trophy. And at the bottom it reads, I don't collect trophies anymore. And you're still collecting trophies. The bad thing is now you're doing it in Jesus' name. You know what happens when we focus on behavior before identity? Every time that behavior will become your identity. Every time. And if it's moral stuff, guess what? You will become superior and proud and self-righteous. And you will become judgmental of others who don't stand up where you stand. And if you fail... As one writer said, that guilt will be utterly devastating to you. Do you see what Paul's doing? It's not about behavior. It's about identity. I might as well have passed out spiritual Fitbits to that camp. We need to remember that we are chosen, and that frees us from proving our worth. We have to remember that we're redeemed and forgiven, which frees us to admit our brokenness. We need to remember that we are trophies of God's grace and that frees us from the pressure of collecting trophies. No striving, no hiding, and no collecting. Can we sing our prayer with the old African blasphemer today? Our closing prayer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Lord. Make it real. Take it deep. May we drink deeply of your grace today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.